So you often hear people say finance and macro need to be more integrated, but um, people have been saying that more since the financial crisis, but people have been saying it for a long time. You know, what do you think that really means, and why do you think progress has been so slow? Um, so there's always been like some connection between macro and finance, I think, for decades. I think most macroeconomics models pre-crisis used by central banks had a pretty passive role for, for, for financial markets, if at all, and which I think you know, obviously turned out to be problematic. Um, but I think people were at least thinking in part about the connections. I mean, there, were, yeah, there was uh, Bernanke, Gertler were writing models of this. There were people trying to look at um, asset prices as barometers of the macroeconomy. So it's, it's um, a, and, and that's all pre-crisis. I think pre-crisis exposed gaps in the existing mo in, in models used by central banks in a pretty dramatic way, and so I guess that's got people rethinking it. But I'm not sure you ever expect progress to be quick in this stuff. Um, knowledge, you know, you might hope it accumulates fast, but it often takes time because you need to probe, understand. We've seen it. So we, you know, we still have conversations about the Great Depression, so it's not as if we uh, um, resolve things really, really quickly. But I'm at least optimistic going forward now that there's um, that, that, that there's a real recognition of the importance of this. It's almost kind of funny. You know, ten years ago or fifteen years ago, the notion of a field called macro finance just was not. I mean, there's finance, there's macro, but but now it just seems like we almost have a separate field now called macro finance, and, and, and that's kind of emerged in the last several years, and and, and you know, it, it, um, and it's trying to get an identity of its own, and, and, and I think that's a recognition of the importance going forward. So, I guess why is it so slow? I think lots of progress is slow. Um, I do think the financial crisis made us rethink some very important issues, and and I'm cautiously optimistic we'll continue to make progress. So when you say that um, finance plays a passive role, I mean, how could it play an active role in macro models? Well, I mean, in, initially it played a passive role, but, uh, but in, in many, but not all models. Um, we think a lot of the standard asset pricing models uh, um, yeah, that came out of the 70s, um, even you know, some motivated by Burton's work to some extent, and, and by, by you know, Breed and Lucas and a variety of others. The macro economy was just sitting there, and then from there you figured out asset prices. And so that's a sense in which the asset pricing was a primitive, uh, was a passive role. But uh, the more active role is when you imagine that they're thinking about financial in intermediation as an important component of the macro economy, um, what important wedges might exist in terms of um, uh, between the financial intermediaries and, 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 the, and, and the household sector and the like. Uh, once you start putting those on the table, then it's kind of a, a little bit of a whole new ball game. And, and, and so I think that's, it's, it's, so I think those type of issues become quite important. Yeah, I think it's related to frictions. In the past, most of us have assumed that financial markets work in nearly frictionless settings. And the problem is that when you have frictionless financial markets, they don't really play a big role. They're really there to deal with all of the various different excess demand and supplies from the real side, and they adjust instantaneously. As soon as you acknowledge that financial markets do actually face frictions, you then get some really interesting interactions between finance and macroeconomics. And one of the things that we learned from the financial crisis is that there are all sorts of frictions. Uh, one of the biggest frictions actually has to do with financial regulation and the challenges that the regulations impose on both the regulated as well as the regulators. Uh, we're all human and we don't make these judgments instantaneously. And so when regulations falter for a variety of reasons, that actually creates some pretty significant repercussions. So when you say friction, I mean, what do you mean specifically? Like, you know, transactions don't happen seamlessly or they don't happen at all? Well, there are a couple of sources of frictions. Transactions costs are probably the most significant, that it takes time and effort to engage in any kind of transaction and to price certain kinds of commodities and securities. But another kind of friction is regulatory rigidities. You know, we put in regulations in place when we think that it's necessary to correct a market failure, but sometimes those regulations have unintended consequences, and we're not always able to update those regulations instantaneously, and the lag with which regulators respond to certain changes in market innovations, like nowadays financial technology, uh, that's a challenge that I think we have to deal with, and some of the overspill, uh, some of the, the spillover effects can actually affect what uh, we need now see as kind of interaction between macro and finance. So, so I might sit here as an individual and say that I want to go invest in some productive activity out there taking place, 
but I, I myself typically don't have the expertise to make um, all the judgments on what, what are the smart things to be investing in. Um, and, and I don't have enough of a resource, um, I don't have enough of a wealth position myself to make, uh, um, to, uh, to, to, to kind of fund new enterprises and, and the like. So the, the question is, how do we go from households potentially willing to invest to actually getting the investments into productive activities? And there, there's where you know different type of intermediation or intermediaries come into play. Their expertise, the, um, they have to be compensated in certain ways. They face incentives, and then and, and those type of structures can uh, start putting some, you know, ad, you know, additional wedges. I just can't go out and say I'm going to go invest in the most productive things out there. Um, it's just not that easy. So including these sorts of things could really change how traditional macro models work. Absolutely, both of the things we're talking about can absolutely. Mm -hmm. How so? I mean, I know that's kind of an abstract question, but. So what's the engine of growth for an economy? I, 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 we could talk about China. We could talk about the US. It's a big part of it is how do you get resources into new ideas and new ventures um, uh, and the like. And, um, and, th and so that type of activity can be very, very important. Or um, um, how do we make sure that the, you know, the best ideas right now are actually getting the, ch you know, the, you know, the chances to be developed um, and, and you know, the, resources beh the resources behind them? Yeah, I mean, that's such an interesting point. I I'd love it if each of you could talk about what you're doing in healthcare and what you're thinking about climate just so people could see an application uh, beyond just financial markets. My, my interest in applying finance broadly focuses most recently on healthcare because it's pretty clear that there's a challenge there that finance can actually meet. How to deal with the so-called valley of death in drug development. That's the part of the drug development process that happens at the very early stages of university and medical center research all the way to the early stages of clinical trial uh, analysis. Um, it turns out that uh, there's plenty of funding in the later stages of drug development, phase two, phase three clinical trials. But at that early preclinical stage, it's challenging because of the increase in risk and uncertainty over the course of the last few years. The fact that we've gotten better at biomedical innovation, the fact that we've gotten smarter at dealing with various kinds of diseases, has actually made the economic risks greater because now there are many more ways that an existing drug company can become obsolete mm -hmm. when some young upstarts come and change the, uh, the nature of the drug development process through these new technologies. So using financial engineering by pooling, using securitization, derivatives, and other tools, we can actually reduce those risks and be able to bring more investors into this important space. And in that sense, everybody wins because obviously investors are going to earn a higher rate of return on their capital. Uh, there's less uncertainty about the underlying uh, projects that are going on in the portfolio. And patients ultimately are going to be able to get better treatments faster and at a lower cost of capital. So there are lots of interesting finance issues associated with that process, and I've been spending a lot of time with colleagues in the biomedical sciences to try to understand how to apply them in a somewhat more systematic way. So you're securitizing. The hope is that we will eventually be securitizing. <laughs> right now, what we're doing is using portfolio theory, uh -huh. an even simpler concept, oh, wow. and creating larger portfolios uh -huh. of projects and more permanent pools of capital rather than the traditional venture <clears throat> capital model. So changing that kind of a business model take into account the risks is already starting to have an impact it's being applied and we believe that over the course of the next year or two we're going to actually see the first securitization of drug development projects so the climate economics and uncertainty um this is, this is one of these subjects that has been about 10 times harder than i thought it was going in and i thought it was going to be hard going in um, so what I thought would be a really nice thing to do is to take knowledge of climate science with its uncertainties and actually formally include that in the economic models. I thought some of the initial stabs at uh, kind of building climate economic models were very, very naive about the uh, inputs coming in from climate science. You know, they, were, they, they were taking shortcuts. They wanted to do illustrations. Remarkably, their calculations show up, you know, used to show up on the EPA webpage as a social cost of carbon, but you know, it, you know, that, that, you know, the, you know, the rationalizations behind those numbers was uh, uh, somewhat flimsy, to say the least. But this is, all, this has turned out to be much more challenging because there's kind of climate scientists build these very, very complex models. They're highly complex. They're highly nonlinear. They don't really put in things like random shocks that economists always like to do, but instead they play off the nonlinearities of the system. Um, 
I can't, I just can't take one of those models, stick it inside some economic model that's dynamic and kind of work out everything. This is a total, it's, just, it's, it's kind of completely intractable. And e even within that, they face uncertainty about how to calibrate parameters and stuff like that. So it's, it's, I, ca I can't just import climate science <laughs> into economics and, 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 and kind of wave the magic wand and it's all over. Um, it turns out climate scientists themselves fully understand this complexity issue and they themselves are building ways to approximate their complex models with much simpler models and they're and, and, and then they're you know, at least providing notions of some of the uncertainties um, uh, uh, that come out of it as they uh, um, look at these simplified approximations and then going across, across the different climate type models and so we're able to start trying to use some of that information and, and build it in tractable ways to get uh, 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 inside economic models. Um, I've been lucky enough to have collaborators that know more climate science than I do, and that which, which is incredibly helpful because my own knowledge is um, is quite thin. Uh, right now, we're engaged in illustrative calculations, quite frankly, uh, uh, even though they're you know they're they're requiring a fair bit of computational power, and we're hopeful down the road that we can work towards more credible uncertainty inputs in uh, uh, um, inside the models. Part of what we're doing now is setting up computational laboratories that or that we can figure out what components of uncertainty really matter in terms of things like the social cost of carbon and which ones are more inconsequential. And so, so therefore we can figure out the places where we uh, should probe into more specificity and the like. So I think it's a fascinating question. Um, it's turned out to be a very hard one to do fully credibly. We're going to have to take a whole bunch of shortcuts to get anywhere. Uh, but of course the topic I think is uh, rather important and, and I do find a lot of this is we're doing is from more the social perspective and not just the private private perspective and the wedge between private and social is kind of the issue here right you how important is this externality uh, um, and uh, and trying to quantify that so asset pricing type methods are both helpful in thinking through the private valuation as well as the social valuation and and, and then also the corresponding wedge are you finding different results in the traditional models so far uh, you mean the tr traditional economic models? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're trying to show where the uncertainty inputs really matter from the climate side. There's been a lot of work on the economic side that's explored so-called damages, but, but even there, people are kind of making up nice, simple, tractable damage specifications without, <laughs> with, uh, uh, without fully grounding them just because it's hard. Because part of the damage assessment is that if you change the climate, people themselves will adapt. They'll change their economic activities, and to really you know, model damages, you uh, one has to model that adaptation process, which I think we we're, we're not very good at either. So, so that's another important part of it. I think there's been more work done on the economic side on the damage sensitivity, uh, even though there's much to be done there, and, and 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 we're trying to show which part of the climate side of it is you know really important, and and, and kind of which parts aren't. Yeah, it, it reminds me of the essay you just wrote about having to make choices when you model about what you include and what you don't. Right, yeah. I mean, do you feel like MFM has made a lot of progress in terms of uh, furthering how, you know, how people think about risk, how people understand how to model it, certainly in macro, but in general? So, it's interesting. So I, um, when, when we started this project, there was this essay that Andy wrote that I, um, I was, um, um, I also made reference to. Not always fully complimentary, but you know, <laughs> about about how there's a, how we're in this great shape. We have these like 25 measures of systemic risk, and and I try to turn that on its side to say, well, maybe <laughs> maybe that's not such great news. Maybe, maybe we need to like open up the hood even more. And and, and Andy would agree with this 100%. Uh, it, it, his essay was very valuable because it was kind of a taking stock of knowledge type just type uh, you know type essay. So I'm I, I was I was being unfair in my Re um, references to it, but um, I think w we would all agree that kind of having this single notion, one measure of what the systemic risk is, is kind of pie in the sky and probably even not right, even not the right way to think about it. Because the problem out there is has so many different dimensions to it um, that 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 that, that um, there's different ways to think about sy um, systemic risk. Is it this externality coming through the place that you know these these financial institutions face constraints that involve market prices? Those market prices move that, that you know that you know that induces fire sales and on, on and on. Or is it I've got some big financial network and there's a, these network externalities that if that if some key part of the hub fails that it makes the whole system crash? I and mean, there's these different type of ways to even think about you know what it might be and. 
we brought in a very wide range of rather distinguished scholars at the outset. And there's kind of no hope that they were ever going to think about this problem one in one common way. And they each had their own time, kind of take on it and their own priorities and the like. And that's, and that's shown up even to, you know, five or six years, you know, six or seven years later, we're running this conference where they're all reporting on their different projects. And they're doing different things and they're different pieces of this. So I, I do think that we've sharpen the questions. I think there's been some, some important progress on the research side. And I think even more important, we have put this, we've helped to put this topic on the radar screen of a lot of very smart young people and young scholars that have been able to come to this event, these events, talk to other people in their cohorts, to talk to other senior scholars and the like. So there's been an investment in the future here that I would like to think is going to have very positive impact. Yeah, I think that one of the most important things we did was to bring together lots of different perspectives because it was pretty clear from the outset that no one person or school of thought had the answer on how to deal with systemic risk in the financial system. And so uh, by having a diversity of perspectives, <clears throat> we were really seeding the soil to try to grow a number of different potential solutions. And we knew it was going to take some time. And uh, so our, our thinking was that it, if you bring together really great people and you put in front of them a variety of interesting uh, intellectual challenges that some amazing things will happen. And uh, I agree with Lars 100% that one of the most valuable things that we did was to bring young scholars, graduate students and assistant professors into the process because I think until they were really confronted with these issues uh, in black and white, we brought regulators, financial professionals, um, all the various different stakeholders until they actually see these problems front and center, it's very hard for them to grasp what kind of thesis topics or research papers they can work on. But over the course of the last seven years, they've done that. They've seen all of these various different interesting ideas, and they've responded in kind with uh, something like 80 different uh, students and dissertations that have been developed out of this process. And so we think that over the course of the next five or 10 years, there's going to be even more progress when these young scholars turn into the kind of productive uh, um, leaders that we expect them to. So going in, into this project, I, I was really had little idea what central banks were doing in terms of the research support for their, um, uh, for their kind of macroeconomic mm -hmm. oversight. And it was, I thought, I think it was valuable both to this, um, to myself and uh, you know, and, and others, to get this perspective. We were lucky enough to get some of the top, you know, heads of research departments to come here and really say, look, here's what we're doing, and they're open to you know discussions about you know what it accomplished and where the gaps were. And I think that was not only advantageous to some of the lead scholars here. I think it was, and that it was tremendously valuable for the young people to actually see what the policy challenges were. So what's next for MF? <laughs> that, that is to be determined, I think. Um, so this particular project and the way it's structured and this, the structure which we've had, this kind of um, multi-university structure of, uh, um, into, uh, is for a variety of reasons is, is, is going to have to be modified. Um, we were very, very lucky in terms of having funding support, you know, you know, the Sloan Foundation really got us off the ground, and, 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 and then the CME gave us some complimentary money as well. I mean, and, then, yeah, and, and, then we've, had, and we've also had some other sources, but I think the Sloan, was, the, the Sloan grant really got us going on all this, and, and, they, and, and, and they were kind enough to fund us through two cycles. Um, so now we have to rethink about um, Chicago, where we've got something called the um, Macro Finance Research Program. Uh, there's an entity at at MIT, which uh, Andy can tell you about. There's ones at uh, there's there's, uh, there's an entity at Princeton. Of course, Rob Engel has his volatility lab um, at um, at NYU. We've been talking to people at LSC, at people at Oxford, and so maybe what we have sh what we're hoping we might better do is to imitate aspects of this is kind of build some type of network across these different centers around uh, and, and maybe have them co-host conferences and stuff like this so, so that there's aspects of this that we can continue. The part that is a little bit I'm, I'm sure about is how to fund the young scholars and all this. Because I, you know, part of what they got was funding, but they also said, we're happy to give you funding, but we want you to come to our events. Mm -hmm. We want you to give posters on what to, on sessions on what research you're doing, and we want you to talking to, talking to other people. I, I need to think what a good way is to continue to build this network of scholars, I think, and 
we're open to ideas on that, I believe. Yeah, certainly when we started the MFM project, that was in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis. And so the need to bring together macroeconomists and financial scholars to try to understand the nature of financial stability, uh, that was pretty clear. And so getting funding from the Sloan Foundation was absolutely critical in creating this kind of a, a seed environment where we were able to get lots of people involved. Having done that, I think we largely accomplished the mission that we were set out to do. The question is, going forward, what else needs to be done? We still think that systemic risk is an important issue that needs to be addressed, and so certainly we haven't solved it. And the problem is that right now, the industry as well as the regulators seem to be a little bit less urgently focused on that, uh, partly because the stock market has done well over the last decade. Uh, it looks like business is growing and uh, economic growth is strong. Uh, and that's in kind of an environment where the seeds of the next financial crisis mm -hmm. are being planted and, and watered. So we think that there's still a need, but it's not clear that other sources would agree with us. So the hope is that over time, the students and the scholars that develop into full-blown academic leaders. They will be able to push the agenda forward. But if, if we find uh, suitable parties that are interested in supporting this effort, we're certainly happy to, to help organize it.